All right. Welcome to the Berman Institute of Bioethics seminar series. Uh, my name is Deborah Matthews, and I am very, very pleased to introduce Peter Rees. Uh, he's a professor of medicine, epidemiology, ethics, and health policy at the University of Pennsylvania. His Rees. Uh, Okay, <laughs> his research focuses on developing effective strategies to increase access to solid organ transplantation, improving the process of selecting and caring for living kidney donors, determining outcomes of health policies on vulnerable populations with renal disease, including the elderly, testing strategies to improve important health behaviors such as medication adherence, and transplant ethics. He's a past chair of the Ethics Committee for the United Network of Organ Sharing, which oversees organ allocation and transplantation regulation in the US and a Greenwall Scholar. And importantly, he trained here. <laughs> so this is a little bit of a homecoming for him and we are so welcome, so happy to have you. Thank you. Um, awesome to be here. Campus doesn't look anything like when I was here, <laughs> which is great. Berman keeps growing. I met my wife here, so a lot of good luck here. But um, anyway, I know it's a very multidisciplinary crowd. I'm going to try to like sort of talk in a way that gives everybody something. But um, there may be, you know, some superficiality to some things I talk about, and I'm happy to talk afterwards about anything we cover. So I have some disclosures, and they do uh, touch on the research that I did. Some of the studies that I'm going to talk about, um, I couldn't afford and the NIH couldn't afford. So I took money from industry in order to, to do them. Um, so I'm going to try to go with a different style of talk than I usually do. And I'm going to try to do storytelling, essentially. Um, so transplant science, I'm here because it's really enabled by ethics and epidemiology and health services research. Really, none of it would get done if those minimum three legs of the stool weren't covered. And in the first story, I played a central role and so did a lot of faculty members at Hopkins, some here, some who have left. And I'm kind of a bit player in the second story. Um, so there are going to be a lot of ethical issues in everything I say. And um, some of them I'll point out, and some of them I think will be by implication. So I want to talk, I'm going to be talking about autonomy and informed consent in a frail population with few good treatment options where a lot of times they have to make decisions fast. Um, I'm going to talk about non-maleficence, which is maybe an ethical principle, depending on who you talk to, but people feel it and autonomy and tensions within a multidisciplinary team, some, a team where some people basically refuse to do the work while others said they would because they had a really different sense of what was reasonable. Um, I'm going to talk about beneficence at the bedside. And just thinking about things like, you know, if you're going to do disease transmission on purpose, what does that mean for your patient? What does it mean for public health? Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about health equity. And here's where, you know, potentially we can brainstorm later. Um, but with something like xenotransplant, where it's an emerging therapy and you're choosing patients one by one, it's really important to think about health equity, but it's a little bit hard to tell if it's happening. You know, if you have to just choose one patient, how do you know if there's health equity? And you know, in some cases, I think maybe you need to back up and say, like, what's the process? And I think the other thing that's really interesting about the health equity piece is that um, one person's, I need access to this clinical trial because it's special, looks like health equity. But the flip side of the coin is you're experimenting on me. Why did you choose me for this clinical trial? It's not equity. So it, sometimes it really depends on how the trial goes. Um, but here's my outline in terms of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm really pleased that there are a bunch of kidney-focused people in the room. But what I'm just going to mention is that um, there's a really large number of people with end-stage kidney disease. That's the tip of the iceberg. There's like tens of millions of chronic kidney disease. So at any given time in the United States, there's 500,000 people getting dialysis, and they gobble up a huge percentage of the Medicare budget. Um, it's just a very expensive and unsatisfying disease to treat. And if you walked into a dialysis unit when I was a medical student here in 1999, and you walked into a dialysis unit now, like, it's not that different. I mean, Hamid, we probably could walk into that unit in 1999 and look at what orders they put down and look at what orders they put down now. It hasn't changed that much. There's a few new therapies, but it's kind of the same business, and it, it's a tough business. 
And so um, some of the lucky patients get on the kidney transplant waiting list, but it's a total, like just, it's one of the few overt rationing processes in the United States that's just going on all the time. So the blue line is the number of people on the kidney transplant waiting list. It's kind of been plus or minus 80,000 for a while. But if you had a kidney transplant supply that was infinite, and you could bring it to people when they needed it and the toxicity was reasonable, we would transplant lots more patients than that. This is just the people who are lucky enough to get on the waiting list after we rationed it. But even if you get on the waiting list, um, it's not that great. So if you get on the waiting list, what you're just gonna see here is basically a sand plot. This is three years after being on the waiting list. So if you've been on the waiting list for three years, you take all those people, what happens? Well, like maybe 16% get, get a living donor transplant maybe like 20% get a deceased donor transplant, and then you know a whole bunch die. And then there's the green, which is you got removed from the waiting list. That means you're either gonna die soon or people think you are, you're too frail to get a transplant. Everybody at the top is still waiting essentially. So even if you get on the waiting list, like if you're over 60, you get on the waiting list, you're much more likely to die than get a transplant. And a lot of the people on the waiting list are over 60. So um, it's not even that great if you get on the waiting list, there's a big slog ahead. So in the midst of that, you know, periodically people get very agitated and they're like, we got to do something, we got to do something. And that leads us to our two stories. So the big timeline is um, back uh, pre-2013, I call that the interferon era because the first thing I'm going to talk about is hepatitis C. So in 2013, you know, this is when I learned about hepatitis C in medical school, because it's a terrible treatment, right? you had to inject yourself with interferon, which made you feel like you had the flu every day. Um, you had to do that for six months, needles for six months, everybody hated that. And then at the end of that, chances were 50-50, maybe less that you'd be cured. So the other thing about the interferon era is that when I went to medical school, I think hepatitis C was kind of sitting in the corner with HIV essentially. It was a, uh, you know, an illness that nobody wanted to have because, have because the treatment options were poor. And also, you know, the way that most people got hepatitis C was uncertain and often involved blood transfusions, but also injection drug use. And so a lot of the people who had hepatitis C, um, you know, were burned with stigma. Um, so it had like, I think a disease identity that was pretty clearly negative. Um, so around 2013 was when the first um, oral um, hepatitis C medications developed. And around that time, everything was kind of changing. And I think one thing that's really interesting about hepatitis C is just seeing how the identity of a disease can really change with the therapeutic. So something becomes stigmatized, not just because who gives it to you, how you get it, but also if you can get rid of it or not, essentially. So when those drugs came out, there were a bunch of groups, including us, including Christine Duran at Hopkins, people elsewhere who were like, oh, okay, so now I guess donors with hepatitis C, they could donate their kidneys. Um, but there was a ton of resistance to that. So in 2015, we published an ethics argument. We started the clinical trials. We made our public presentations. And then by 2020, this practice that was really on the fringe became very common. And then we'll move forward to the next thing, the next sort of symptom of restlessness, which is pig transplants, heart, kidney. So this is the time machine that uh, we're going to go through. But what I wanna do is that when I tell these two stories, I just wanna give you a sense of what were the reactions to the idea of infecting people with hepatitis C on purpose and see if we kind of hear any rhyming in some of the things that we're hearing now. Um, some people think that ethics arguments ultimately come from things that are happening behind cognition. So some people think that ethics arguments actually emerge because people have a deep seated positive or negative valence towards something and then they turn on their cognition to develop arguments in favor of that feeling that they had. I don't know if that's true. It might not be true for everybody, but I can tell you in the field that I'm, I've been in, I think there's like a lot of emotion under the surface. People, you can kind of tell that they have a positive or a negative balance towards the practice. And then sometimes you can see the ethics following that. So I'm just gonna tell you how it looked to me because I'm storytelling today. And then you can tell me if it resonates with you. But both with hepatitis C and with xenotransplant, it wasn't really a new idea. It was basically taking an old idea and freshening it up. And what I'll talk to you about xenotransplant is that xenotransplant's been going on 
for like a hundred years, basically. Like it's really an old practice. No one even really knows when it first started, but technology kind of refreshes these things that were historically interesting. So what happened with hepatitis C is there were some kind of old vague publications from the interferon era, where like at the University of Wisconsin, they reported on their experience transplanting 110 patients, donor positive, recipient negative, in an era where you couldn't really treat it because interferon also causes you to reject your transplant, but also they couldn't check viral loads in real time. So when they were transplanting people with hepatitis C, probably most of those organs had hepatitis C, but then some didn't. So then when they looked at the outcomes, you know, people might or might not get infected with hepatitis C because all they could do was check for antibody. So anyway, if you read some of these articles like this one, it was sort of like, we did this. Some people develop liver failure. They didn't live very long, but also who did they choose? What was interesting, which again is another thing that kind of rhymes with the present, was that their idea was let's choose the sickest, most desperate people, which ethically does seem like it kind of makes sense but if you try to figure out what happened in the end, you can get very confused, right? Because if you take the sickest people and you give them a therapy that's tough and they all die, you might erroneously conclude that you're totally on the wrong path and walk away. And I think that that's what happened. And by the way, when things go really bad, people usually don't publish it at all. So anyway, what was happening in 2015 was that most kidneys from donors with hepatitis C were discarded. And so were all of the hearts, and so were all of the lungs, and so were all of the pancreases and most of the livers. And so the interesting thing that emerged in this time, the, the blue is the kidneys that were act actually transplanted, is they were almost all transplanted to people who already had hepatitis C. So the idea was they already have it, we'll give it to them. But then it kind of went beyond that into this idea that the only right thing to do is to give the organs to the people who already have it. Those are their organs, essentially. But the other thing that changed was that around the same time, by coincidence that the drugs came out, the opiate epidemic took off. And so the profile of the hepatitis C donor then really changed. So I've diagnosed people with hepatitis C before. And the, the classic stereotype from my practice, you know, in the 2000s was like a baby boomer who might have been partying. That was the kind of language that at least one of these people used. I, I was partying a lot in my 20s. They got hepatitis C by accident. They really had no idea because it's an asymptomatic infection most of the time. And then they just turned up to have hepatitis C later. So that was the old profile. And people in their 40s are usually not heart donors. They're usually not lung donors. They're usually not a pancreas donor. So with the opiate epidemic, the profile of someone with hepatitis C might turn into someone who's like a web designer who's 28, who lives in Moncton, and then has a drug overdose. Their family didn't even know that they were using opiates. And the average age falls down to the 30s. So now they couldn't just be, their family couldn't just um, raise their hand for them to be a kidney donor. They could be a heart donor, a lung donor, a pancreas donor. So the whole profile of hepatitis C also, the disease identity kind of changes because of the opiate crisis. So we proposed this trial so did um, Christine Duran and Naraj Desai and group down here. And what happened? So uh, the quartet at Penn who put this together was me, a hepatologist, Emily Blumberg of infectious diseases and a surgeon. So we presented it to the four other surgeons and basically two of the surgeons were like, I won't do this. So if there's an organ offer, you can call me, but I'm not coming in because I don't think that that's an okay thing to do. So one of the other surgeons was like, okay, that's fine. You can call me instead. I'll come in and sew the organ in. So it was a very kind of like divisive proposal, essentially. And it, it was kind of intense emotions. And I think what they felt like is, you know, you, can, you might not be able to cure the patient because you, with immunosuppression, sort of wipe out the immune system right away. And you'll harm people. And there, there's definitely like, I believe for people who do procedures, a different feeling of, of like the nature of responsibility and harm that, you know, I could be running the trial. I could be on the IRB. I could be on the piece of paper. I might be the person the lawyer would call. But the surgeon who sews it in often feels they experience it emotionally differently. Like I threw that stitch. I closed that patient. That's, that's my patient. So there was a feeling of harm. I think a feeling of personal responsibility. Um, there was this idea that you'd lose trust in transplant. And 
Transplant is a very um, reputationally based field, essentially. You know, until we can get all the pig organs that we want, we're entirely dependent on generous behavior, essentially. Like people have to come forward, they have to register as organ donors. Often the family can stand in the way, or not often, the family can sometimes stand in the way, even if they've registered as an organ donor, then there's living donors. So without gener the generosity and goodwill of the public, it can collapse. And we've seen that in a couple of places, um, both in the United States and more recently, maybe 10 years ago in Germany, there were falsification of patient records in order to get patients to advance up the transplant list faster and organ donation rates go down. So you can really blow it in transplant with a failure of brand management. If you don't manage your brand, you might not do any more transplants. Brand management sounds so dirty, right? But like really, if you're in science, you gotta get in the business of brand management because our reputations are precious. And then there was this other idea essentially that um, what you should only do is put these kidneys in the people who already have hepatitis C, then if all of them say no, give it to somebody else. And that was also kind of funny. We are still doing that with HIV. But it is weird because usually when you allocate organs and you read like you know, transplant ethics 101, it's like, is it efficient? Is it equitable? And there isn't really anything about efficiency or equitably necessarily about taking an infected kidney and putting it into a person without infection. There could be someone else who would benefit more. And it's not like because you have hepatitis C that you're more deserving than others. But it was status quo. And that's really what people were stuck with. And then I think, you know, in the back of the room, you know, with his arms folded, it was stigma, essentially, that we had to kind of get beyond. But what was really interesting is that the patients didn't really feel the same way about it. Because, you know, we learn about hepatitis C because this is John Hopkins, but um, most patients really hadn't heard it and weren't thinking that much about it. So in a way, I think the stigma was much heavier for the medical providers. So anyway... When we made our ethics argument, so we had enough time to write an ethics analysis and push that forward first. And essentially what we kind of said was, well, what's too much risk? Um, people often in transplant like to say, well, you know, look how well a, person, a donor without hepatitis C's kidney would do. But it's like, no, that's not the comparison. The comparison is someone who's suffering through dialysis, waiting for an organ. That's the real comparator. Um, Public trust, we had the DSMB and IRB, those are ways to maintain it. I think the hardest thing was like balancing consent with complexity. So, you know, end stage kidney disease patients, not all, but on average, are often pretty low health literacy. Kidney disease is really devastating in low health literacy communities for many reasons. And trying to kind of get through all this um, and make feeling like patients could understand the consent was challenging. But the way that we did it, and again, I think this could rhyme with xenotransplant, is that um, we would call a patient. So a doctor would call a patient, and I'm probably one of the only people in the room who's had the opportunity to call a patient and say, hi, my name's Peter, and I'd like to infect you with hepatitis C. How does that sound to you? Um, and, you know, most patients, of course, I didn't say it quite that way, but most patients actually don't know what hepatitis C is. Um, some of these drug companies were starting to have ads, and you know what these ads look like whether it's for um, you know, knee replacements, birth control, tampons, or hepatitis C, they're always walking on the beach with the cuffs of their pants. <laughs> and they were like, oh, I think I saw an ad you know, about that. Um, so we would call them, invite them into an educational session, go over a very standardized uh, set of slides, invite family members, pay for parking, offer food, and then not let them consent the same day they had to go home and then they had to make that same schlep back in. I know people hate driving into Hopkins, right? They don't like the traffic, the parking, yeah. the people are unfriendly and they hated it Penn too. So they had to want it a lot. Maybe that wasn't the best way, but there was um, sort of revealed preference that they really wanted it. Um, so for the study design, what happened, um, and this also I think probably will rhyme with a xenotransplant clinical trial is that there was a company to sponsor it because the drugs cost $80,000. So there wasn't any way not, this is my excuse, there wasn't any way not to get into bed with the drug company because there isn't an NIH budget that's gonna eat $80,000 for treatment course. But basically they said, you can do one and then we're gonna watch and see how it goes. And then with hepatitis C, you can watch the viral load go down. So if the viral load's going down, then you can do two more and then we're gonna see how it goes. 
So what they're thinking with xenotransplant in clinical trials, at least if you can read the FDA, and the FDA is a very hard organization to read, they're thinking the same thing, do one. As I'll get to later, the hard thing about that is that the Xeno companies have like, you know, dozens of employees that probably cost tens of million dollars to run it for six months while they're waiting for the results. Go ahead. Is it, is it true that you're talking about E, I, and D, no? So one patient with E, I, and D. I'm not sure E, I, and D, pharmaceutical company page. So I, D is, I don't think it's one case for them. No, no, no. The drug company paid for the trial. And they told us that we could do one patient. But the IND? It didn't have anything to do with the IND. We had a waiver of the IND. This was the terms of the contract. No, no, it wasn't compassionate use. It was a clinical trial with a waiver of IND. And this, they, so they, they were writing the check and they said, we'll pay for your trial under these terms. This was the terms of the contract between Penn and the University of Pennsylvania and the drug company. Okay. And I think it was the same terms between the same company and Hopkins. But FDA authorized it to go forward as a clinical trial. So um, there was a there was an exemption of an we had an IND exemption, so the FDA didn't comment on the design or anything else. Can you clarify what IND is for folks who may not know about? I mean, I, I think I know, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So an IND basically is a I may misstate this, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a basically an indicate an approved indication for a drug. And so I think if a drug company wants to be able to market something to say, like, now this drug can be used for whatever disease, there has to be an IND to cover that indication. So the drug company was not trying to get um, a new approval for this drug in the setting of transplant. They were basically like, here's the drug, go ahead. Okay, so what we did was we did not choose the most desperate patients. We did not choose patients who... Uh, were too sick to get on the waiting list or were non-compliant, didn't have any other options. They were on the waiting list, but they had so little priority for waiting time that they had a pretty good chance of death or disability by the time they got a human transplant. Didn't have liver disease. And also we were pretty conservative about them not having a kidney disease that could recur. So I'll go through this pretty quickly, but I just want to kind of keep pointing to the lessons that came out. But basically what we found is that we called 66 people, I called a bunch of them, and basically half of them said, I don't, I'm not interested in that. And then, you know, those people who came in, they listened to the educational session, only two more uh, dropped out, and then we eventually transplanted 20. So um, I've done some studies, uh, Olivia and um, uh, Christine have, about you know, decision-making in this setting and talking to people who were in the trial. We've also talked to people who declined participation. And basically the reasons for declining were various. So one is like some people actually feel like I'm in an equilibrium on dialysis and I don't really wanna do anything different. So I've told you that dialysis is burdensome and for some people it's really miserable. Some people withdraw from dialysis and I'll touch on that later. Some people who are in you know, sound mind are basically like, look, I'm not suicidal. I'm just not doing this anymore. So stop the treatment. So you have that on one on one extreme. And the other extreme, you have people who are like, you know, I'm okay. I go to work. I have a family. Everything seems fine. I haven't had a setback. But that person can be different in a year. They might totally sort of change their feeling. So a bunch of people are like, I'm doing fine. I don't need your study. Some people um, you know, might have felt hepatitis C yuck, or they might have heard that from their physician. Some people, you know, just like research study, don't experiment on me, I'm not interested. Um, and then, you know, I think people got various messages from the other trusted members of their medical team. In terms of who the patients were, our population is probably a lot like yours, about 40% black, a lot have diabetes, more male than female. And for those of you who know what creatinine is, the first kidneys that we took were really good because very few people wanted them, so we could be very selective. Some of the creatinines were like 0.5, some of the donors were in their 20s. So the good news was that um, cure rates turned out to be like 100%, that was really awesome. There was only one patient who we had to treat with a second round of therapy. Um, so we were really pleasantly surprised that, I think what happened is that if you infect someone with hepatitis C and you treat them right away, the virus has a difficult time establishing itself, so cure rates are even higher than people who have normal immune systems and have been you know, infected for years. 
Um, an allograph function, these are creatinines on the y-axis, and this is time on the x-axis, also is quite good. Um, but one of the other things that I'm going to mention that uh, came out of this, which could also be useful in experiments going forward, is that there have been very big advances in multidimensional matching. And so in the United States every year, you know, if we do 25,000 kidney transplants, but then you do an experiment with just 10 or 20 kidney transplants, what you can do is you can look at that pool of 25,000 and you can find recipients that are identical in every way to the transplant you just did, except they didn't get a hepatitis C infected kidney. So what I'm trying to say here is that um, this may not be better than multivariable regression, except in the presentation of results, sometimes it can be more persuasive. So what I mean is that if I do a transplant in a 55 year old uh, white female with diabetes whose blood type O, and then I have a pool over there of 25,000 patients who got a transplant the same year, I can find another person who is also 55 years old and also white and also diabetic and do that kind of matching. So what it does is it enables you, you can never sort of match on everything because there's some things that you don't see, but in terms of, in terms of sort of results presentation, I think it, it creates a level of um, simplicity and understanding the outcome. So anyway, uh, it turns out that the guy who invented the propensity score was on my campus, little did I know. Um, his name's Paul Rosenbaum, super nice guy. Um, and this is the guy, uh, Vishnu, who I work with. So what we did essentially is we said, we had 20 thinker recipients, that was the name of the trial. And we found comparators five to one and were able to match them almost perfectly on a bunch of really important things. And then what you can see is that you could look at the distribution of their kidney function in people who got kidneys with the exact same quality score and then people who got kidneys with an even better quality score, and you can see the distributions are really overlapping. So we were able to do some nice things to sort of take the message out to the field that the kidney function was pretty good. And then um, at Hopkins with the expander trial, very, very similar results, really great results. And at the Brigham with um, this heart and lung transplant trial, very similar, 100% uh, hepatitis C cure rates, a little bit more objection, probably not a big deal. But you know, the interesting thing about trying to convince people is that storytelling is much more effective. So I was at the American Transplant Congress. Um, Naraj and Christine were there. We gave our presentation. We showed our data. People's blood pressure went up. There was a lot of disagreement about whether or not we should be offering these kidneys to people without hepatitis C as we were doing. But then Bob Montgomery, you know, went to the Wall Street Journal. He got a heart transplant from a donor with hepatitis C. You know, the world's most charismatic transplant surgeon not only gets a transplant with hepatitis C, but takes a you know, invites the uh, photographers, you know, into the cath lab to take pictures of them. So, you know, this was a big moment. You can present as much data as you want. But if you can say something like, well, this transplant surgeon took an organ from hepatitis C, you might want to consider it. it probably changes hearts and minds, you know, a lot more than those violin plots with the pretty pictures that I just showed you. So essentially what happened was, um, this was when we gave our heated presentations at the Transplant Congress. Within three years, it became something that doesn't really, no one bats an eyebrow. Like more than half the transplant centers in the country do it. More than a thousand transplants in the United States every year happen because of this. The main issues are like payment and pharmacy coverage. So things can really change a lot, but I think the most interesting thing was maybe the change in disease identity, essentially. If you can cure a disease that looks different, but stigma is complicated and the sort of distribution of stigma perception can vary a lot. You know, it can look really different to one patient or another. And also in this case, the physicians were more stuck on the stigma than the patients were. The patients didn't really know what hepatitis C was. So in my brain, hepatitis C and HIV were holding hands because that's how I learned about them at Hopkins. But in the minds of the patients, they were like, I don't really know what that is, but you can treat it. So, okay, at least half. Half came to the interviews. So now we talk about pigs um, because, uh, you know, pigs can hold stigma. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, the history. So um, in the early 1900s, there were these like one-off transplant experiments, like Alexis Carroll, people who are like, you know, really were involved in um, 
vascular access, pioneering surgeons from the very beginning. But it's like really hard to believe, but maybe not that hard to believe when you learn about some of the early experiments. So Keith Reisma was like a giant of surgery. Um, he transplanted six chimpanzee kidneys into six people in Mississippi in the 1960s. I mean, that was like a long time ago. And one of them lived nine months and then died. They think due to electrolyte abnormalities, but nobody really knows. Because in addition to not having a lot of immunosuppression back then, they didn't have a lot of IRB oversight back then. <laughs> and the standards of research follow-up were kind of limited. But I think that's kind of crazy because I think if you had that headline in the New York Times three years ago, someone put six chimpanzee kidneys into six different patients, people would be like, I'm like really shocked. That happened? That did happen. Um, and then there were other uh, transplants coming out of different groups. Again, I don't know how many went unreported. If they went really bad, maybe they just didn't publish them, but it was happening with Starzl, who's another giant of transplant. Um, I really recommend this book. Josh Mesrich um, is a surgeon at the University of Wisconsin, transplant surgeon, also a writer. His brother writes thrillers. Um, he writes medical history textbooks, but he breaks down all of this history. But anyway, so in a way, kind of like hepatitis C, it's like reviving something that's been going on for a long time. Um, but people stopped. You could probably have more success with chimpanzee donors than with pig donors at least if you use CRISPR on them, there would be less work to do. Um, but the difficulty is that we sympathize with primates. Also, they take a long time to raise their young and they don't have large litters. Um, so the move was towards pigs. Um, but basically what's interesting is that most of the main concerns have been recognized for a long time. Um, Bob Beach was an amazing uh, transplant ethicist. He was at Georgetown. I was super lucky when I was on the UNOS Ethics Committee, he was on it too. Um, he and Lainey Ross wrote this ethics book, um, a textbook which I can't recommend more highly. It's just like, in terms of the definition of death and things like that, just really clear thinking. But you know, this is decades ago, and what are they talking about? Risk of organ dysfunction. Um, you might reject the organ, your complement system might get out of control, you might have clotting, bleeding, disability, stroke, death. Then there's this big risk of, our, big concern <laughs> about infection, um, that you could get infected by a pig bug, that your bystanders could get infected by a pig bug. But I think the new thing that they didn't really talk about, which is a really big problem that we're probably never going to get back in the bottle, is social media and the spread of information in the contemporary age. So it used to be you could get hospitalized and nobody would know, but that ship has sailed. Um, so anyway, the other thing that developed, of course, was CRISPR-Cas9. And I'm sorry, there's a lot of words on the slide, but basically um, what people had been doing with xenotransplant was <clears throat> trying to fix the recipient with a lot of immunosuppression. And that's still the case, but the, the change in thinking with CRISPR-Cas9 was fix the organ and then modify the organ and then treat the recipient. So um, this is a, a simplified version of what they do, but you hear a lot about alpha-gal. Alpha-gal is a carbohydrate on the surface of cells that exists in a lot of animals like pigs, but does not exist on the cells of humans. So if there's a tissue with alpha-gal on it that goes into your body, your body will recognize it as foreign and immediately attack it. So they took out alpha-gal and took out a bunch of other surface um, molecules. Also um, stuck in some things knocked in some genes to try to, in some cases, modify the complement system. Also, there are some retroviruses, porcine endogenous retroviruses, which some unwise person referred to as pervs, still called pervs, get rid of the pervs. And then, um, but the other piece of it here is that, you know, a lot of transplant happens like in a very suboptimal, hasty way. So what's really much better, you need a knee replacement, set a date, get your affairs in order, stop the medicines that might cause you to bleed, you know, figure out who's going to drive you home from the hospital. Deceased donor transplant is like a fire drill. Donors ready, organs are coming out, working my way down the list, who's ready. A lot of those people are not ready. They've been waiting for a long time. They just had COVID. They don't answer their phone. Their blood sugar is 700. You got to work your way down the list. And then you're like, 
Do you want the organ? Do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? Tick, 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 tick. So that's like not a good way to go through a major procedure. But this offers the opportunity of just-in-time transplant. Basically, you want the transplant. Maybe in the future, you could even have a pig engineered in a way that's like really suitable just for you. So all these things are possible. And then advances in immunosuppression. Um, there were transplants going into non-human primates with survival six months, a year, two years, and then increased interest um, by Bob Montgomery's group and others in this decedent model. So I'm not really going to cover the ethics of the decedent, but I just want to make sure that you know what we're talking about. So um, a person suffers injury and brain death. They still need critical care support. Legally, the body is not a person. It's a human, but it's not a person. So what does that mean? Um, their will is carried out. They can't hold an executive position anymore. If you're the president and you're, you're brain dead, you can be on life support, but you're not the president anymore. Um, people can start disposing of your goods according to your will or the law, but also the IRB doesn't cover this. So you can have a pulse, you can be excreting sweat and carbon dioxide, you can look like you're alive, but you're not a person under the law. Um, so there's no IRB oversight. That's not to say there shouldn't be IR oversight, but that's just the IRB is covering people. <clears throat> Next of kin can authorize disposition of the body, donation to science or organ donation. The way this has worked so far, and I've participated in a few of these at the University of Pennsylvania, is that <clears throat> the organ procurement organizations tend to coordinate this. And they will only allow this when there was no opportunity for organ donation. So after all the organs have been turned down by everyone, then the decedent can be donated for transplantation or excuse me, for uh, these experiments in the dead. So the way Bob Montgomery's group put it is uh, it's de-risking high stakes clinical trials. And just as an aside, there's something appealing about this. If you have a new potentially effective but very toxic medication, you could imagine that Maybe we would all feel better if you gave it to a couple of decedents before you gave it to a couple of people. But that's a whole discussion for a different day, and I'm probably not qualified to lead that discussion anyway. But so um, Bob's group at NYU, and I'm not going to cover all the cases, they did uh, published, they've done more. But what we know about is two brain dead human recipients of kidneys, along with a thymus, um, alpha gal knockout only. 52 up, four hours of follow up. And the big headline was the kidneys made urine and there was no hyperacute rejection. So, hyperacute rejection, as I was telling you about the alpha gal molecule, if you put a pig kidney in your body, very soon, might take an hour and a half, it will turn black, it will get mottled, it will be filled up with a blood clot because the immune system's super activated. Hey, Dan. Um, so, hyperacute rejection was avoided, but when the short experiment, 54 hours, when they took the biopsies and they did deep molecular phenotyping in France, um, they found that there was emerging rejection. So the immune system didn't immediately have a freak out, but it nonetheless marshaled its resources and caused inflammation. So then, as you know, because you live in Baltimore, where exciting things happen, um, there were the transplants at Maryland. And I know you know the story. I'm just going to narrate over the top and tell you how it looked to me. Um, so I just want everyone to remember what FDA expanded access is. So it's sometimes called compassionate use. By the way, I'm not a lawyer. So if I say anything wrong, just correct me. But this is a situation where your primary goal is to have, is to help an identifiable individual. You're not, your primary goal is not generating scientific knowledge. You can generate scientific knowledge as a byproduct, but that's not your primary goal. Um, so they have to have a life-threatening condition. There's no satisfactory or comparable therapy available. Enrollment in a clinical trial is not possible. The IRB has to review it. It does require informed consent. And then the FDA uh, requires safety reporting. So there were two, at least, heart transplants in the living recipients that I know of. And the gentleman that you read about in the paper, I'm sure, was 57. He was very sick. He was not a candidate for heart transplant because he'd been non-adherent. I think he'd been turned down by more than one center. It was compassionate use. He was very frail. There was no hyperacute rejection. So again, that was considered a, a really important thing. He died after two months. Rejection was suspected. And uh, I'm not a cardiologist, but even I could tell that two months later, the heart tissue looked really bad. 
the heart seemed to work well at first, but it was started to look really bad. They were doing serial biopsies after about five weeks. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and I think it has to do with brand management. Did you see my email from earlier? Yes. Okay. Is, was there an infection? So pigs had their own special bugs. There's a virus called cytomegalovirus, CMV. And if you've heard of it, the most of the time we hear about it is we really don't want pregnant women to get CMV. But after transplant, if you're immunosuppressed, you can also get CMV, and that can be a very tough infection to treat, unless you have someone like Dr. Cates here, in which case it's going to be smooth sailing. But pigs have their own CMV, pig CMV. So they found pig CMV in the heart. And, and so then where the interesting debating comes is whether or not this was an infection. So it was a transmission because this pig bug wound up in the pig heart that was in the body of a human. To me, that sounds like infection. However, there are a lot of people in the field that really feel like this needs to be characterized as a transmission, not an infection, because I think that they're making a distinction that there wasn't clear evidence that this pig virus was in the human spreading, actively replicating. So anyway, unfortunately, there was screening for this pig virus, but the pig virus still made it into that human. Um, with that said, there was no detection of retroviruses in the recipient. And when I've talked to the wise minds of infectious disease, it seems as though the general consensus is that by knocking these viruses out with CRISPR, by screening heavily, by being very careful, these pigs, by the way, are raised in pathogen-free facilities in secret locations where they don't get to interact with other animals, that probably this risk of infection transmission is very low. However, it still makes people nervous. So I wanted to mention that that, that did happen that one time. So what happened with privacy? What I heard uh, about that, that was pretty interesting um, is that, um, I mean, I think we all knew that there was like tons of newspaper coverage of this. And the gentleman, David Bennett's name came out like really fast. So what I heard from a guy who was working in an operating room down the hallway from this operating room was that everybody was talking about it. And I don't think it would be any different at Hopkins and I don't think it'd be any different at Penn or Vanderbilt or anywhere else because dozens of people get involved in transplants. They're pushing the organ down the hallway. They're pushing the patient in, you know, on a gurney. They're involved in pathology, laboratory medicine, infectious diseases, pharmacy, like it's a lot of people. So his name got out really fast. So privacy was tough. And I think that that's just something we have to keep in mind for further transplants. But the other thing that I thought was nuts, well, for, first of all, he was not a candidate for a regular heart transplant from a human. Concerning, right? Non-adherence, you're gonna go home. You have to take your medicine if you have a pig heart transplant. That was never tested in him because he never left the hospital. Be that as it may, um, what was crazy was that the Washington Post headline was this. We did our research. We discovered that this guy was uh, convicted of felony assault for stabbing his neighbor like seven times 20 years ago. How come he gets the special transplant? Which was like this crazy like reversal of like how the, a regular person would read it. Like, no, actually you took someone who might not have the best judgment, who is a non-inherent patient, you put a heart in him. I don't know if that was a great idea. So anyway, what's that? I don't know who used him. Yeah. Who yeah. used who? Right. Exactly. But anyway, um, the IRB was involved. He did have an extensive vetting. Um, many people talked to him. As far as I know, he never expressed any ambivalence about participation. The main, the main thing that happened, the main lesson for me, I don't think people would, I, I have doubt that the next recipients of transplants are going to be non inherent patients, but I do think that losing control of the narrative very likely. Um, and I don't think that losing control of the narrative was the fault of the University of Maryland, but I think that they, they had to manage it. Um, and so then I'm sure you saw at Mass General that they did a kidney transplant. And what we know about him is by press release. All of this has been going on by press release because it takes so long for scientific publications to be vetted, but also a lot of misinformation can come out. Um, so he was 62 diabetes prior transplant recipient. Um, they released his name. He was okay with that. And it seems like he was relatively, he was doing okay, but he was demoralized by dialysis and um, he was running out of vascular access and he just didn't want to do it anymore. So he had his transplant. He did reject the kidney within a week, but they treated the rejection and he went home. 
and that's the last we've heard. Um, and that was compassionate use too. So we have compassionate use, we have decedent results, we have one-offs, we have incomplete stories. That's not a path to commercialization as far as I can tell. So I think we're gonna have to get to trials. And I think the question is like, what lessons have we drawn? Can we learn? And I think the five domains basically are, who are we gonna put in the trial? How are we gonna educate them and consent them? Not just to protect them, to protect, but to protect ourselves. How much risk are patients willing to take? How do we contrast those risks to staying on dialysis? And how do we educate and support caregivers? Because what the caregivers are in, in for is like a pretty rocky road, maybe. So I'm just gonna go back to what we did in thinking and tell you how I think it kind of aligns with how I would choose patients for a kidney trial. So my thing is that I think they need to be very disadvantaged by the system. And I don't often say it to patients, but when they come for a kidney transplant evaluation in my clinic, I can basically tell who's more likely to die than get a transplant. Um, but I think they have to be sufficiently robust that I think they're going to survive this process. Because if you do five, you know, xenotransplants and four of them die in the hospital, the field is going to just shut down. Um, I think they have to be resilient. This is a controversial one. A lot of people don't like social support evaluations for transplant. Um, my view on social support evaluations for transplant is that the main problem is they're not transparently carried out. But I don't think you can get away with no social support evaluation for a xenotransplant. But I think the way you do it is going to have to be careful. And I think the patient has to have low enough quality of life that they hate the status quo. And all of these things probably need to be formally evaluated in some way. So I just want to point out that um, this is an epidemiology tool that was built by Jesse Scholl, and I participated a little bit. But here's an example. If you take someone who's 50 to 59, they could be white, they could be black, with limited priority time, they will be much more likely to die than get a kidney transplant, and their probabilities will cross at like 16 months. So you can start with just an epidemiology tool, run your list at Hopkins and say, these are the patients who are more likely to die. Then invite those patients in, use your clinical judgment, figure out if you think that they're resilient enough to handle immunosuppression because you really don't even know how much immunosuppression you're gonna to have to give them. And then you get to the hard part, which is psychological resilience. And I think you have to do this. I don't think I'm qualified to do it, but I think with social work, with psychiatry, maybe rabbis, maybe chaplains, I think you want to make sure that this person really understands, at least if they seem like there are some, you know, if they have mental illness, that it's well treated, that they've met with palliative care. You just wanna make sure that they've gotten everything that they uh, can in terms of support. And then my view is that, um, I was kind of alluding to this earlier that, you know, there are patients who they hate dialysis. They don't want to do it anymore. Um, and if they're that unhappy and they've had the support they needed and they've seen palliative care, I think maybe that's a reasonable person to sign up for this. So, you know, the, I think the FDA, in my view, it's hard to understand what the FDA is thinking sometimes. They've been very focused on people who are likely to die. But I think maybe we could focus a little bit more on people who are just extremely unhappy with the status quo. But... Um, People are different, so it's gonna take a long time to figure out who those people are. They can't have untreated depression. They can't have not seen palliative care, in my view. And then, you know, I think what we did with this slow consent process, very deliberate, is a pretty good model to use. I think it could be used here too. You know, there are some people who had told us at the time, like, do a test, you know, give the person a quiz, make sure that they know that, you know, this is unknown, that's unknown, this is how high the risks are. That's another approach. I'm not always sure that designing those sort of written evaluations, quizzes, are easy to administer to people with different health literacy. So we didn't go that route, but it's another thing that had come up. And then, you know, I think for the informed consent, you just really want the person to come back to you and understand that um, this is experimental. I think a lot of people also think that, um, have, have talked about maybe, you know, if this doesn't work out, they could just get a human kidney transplant. I don't think there's really any road for that. Um, at least our allocation system wouldn't enable that. And I think another big piece of it is that 
you know, it's possible that this transplant and immunosuppression takes so much out of you that you're no longer eligible for a human kidney transplant. So I don't think it's a bridge. And I think you would really want patients to understand all those things. And I don't know what happened at Mass General, but these are some of the things that I would hope that the patient uh, would understand. Um, and then the other big question is that if the patient goes home and they have a fever, what's gonna happen? Well, things went so great in the pandemic. We know exactly how to handle someone who might have a transmissible disease at home because we have so much social cohesion. <laughs> but um, we don't really know how this would play out. But if the patient gets their xenotransplant, they go home and they have a fever and we don't know what's wrong. It seems like people might say you should quarantine. I think it's relatively likely they might be asked to quarantine and maybe their family and caregivers might be asked to quarantine too and they might refuse. I'm not exactly sure how all that would play out, but I think it's part of a big, big part of the informed consent is like, let's just kind of walk through what this looks like. You have a fever and we're nervous that you have a pig bug. Um, but, you know, of course, we always have to contrast it against the alternatives. You know, one of the problems that I always have with informed consent documents is this insistence that you're only going to cover the risks of the new procedure and not weigh them against the problems that you have with the status quo. Like, I think it's okay to say, like, look, I know dialysis is a burden. I know you hate it. Like, I'm really nervous about Xeno, but I understand that I can see dialysis through your eyes. Um, so, and then, you know, you have this conceptual model that's a little different. It's not totally unique. It probably comes up with live vaccine research, for instance, but it's like the caregivers are under the same umbrella of problems that you have to deal with. I'm not sure we're that skilled at meeting caregivers where they are and helping them shoulder those burdens. But in addition to driving them to the hospital, they might have to quarantine too, maybe either to help the person or because there's a concern that they have a bug. So then the very last point that I wanted to make is that I've been thinking a lot about health equity. And this is not something that came up, I think, in a lot of that early um, ethics work about xenotransplant that I mentioned, because I'm not sure that people recognize what the FDA was going to say, which is probably going to be do one and wait, do another and wait. And so this could play out in different ways. It could be like, wow, only the special people at amazing hospitals in big cities like Mass General are getting these transplants, so it's not fair. Or it could play out as you exploited someone. It didn't go well. Um, but I think there are some things that could be done that would be really good. Um, so I think patient advocacy boards for these biotech companies would be a really good idea. So there's really two and a half companies that are driving a lot of this. And um, so a lot of the judgment calls about who they work with, what the protocols look like, size of the checks that they write, really are in the hands of a couple of people who are at the helms of these companies. So I think patient advocacy boards would be really good. And you know, there are like the National Kidney Foundation is trying to like kind of get their voice in the room. I think that's really good. Um, you could um, have initiatives to inform minority communities about xenotransplant with genuine engagement. And what you could do is the biotech companies could say, well, um, we're going to have a request for transplant centers to come to us and say, we want to be part of your trials. And then the biotech companies could say back, well, I know that you have good scientific resources. That's great. Show me evidence that you're genuinely engaged with the minority communities around you. Where's that evidence? You know, do you have an advisory board of your transplant center who's on it? I think that could be good. Um, a participatory, community participatory research approach. Um, I think making the protocols really transparent, um, really being clear about how you found that patient. Because, you know, if you have a, like the worst case scenario, not the worst, but a bad case scenario to me would be, you know, it's like, well, someone in the center who is a leader, they knew a patient and they saw an opportunity that day. I think it would be a lot better to be able to say, well, we ran down the list in this order with these criteria, and then we talk to people, and that's that's how we got to that patient. And then, of course, the usual things about good study materials that are accessible. Um, but I think there's a lot to say about trying to engineer equity into xenotransplant as early as you can, 
um, way before we get to the usual problems we have in the American healthcare system with co-pays or onerous bankrupting patients, coverage decisions, all that stuff. I think going like way upstream of that would be really good. So anyway, that is the end of my storytelling. Um, but I think that um, the last 10 years have seen um, some amazing developments where hepatitis C, infecting patients with hepatitis C became uh, relatively routine. And I think there were lessons in that. And now xenotransplant is moving really fast, but we have very big hurdles ahead in moving from these decedent and compassionate use studies to trials. Um, these early problems that we're seeing, rejection, infection, bystander effects, those seem like they're real and loss of privacy seems really real too. And I think this isn't gonna work unless we have really strong collaboration between trialists, regulators, and ethicists. So the Berman Institute uh, has to help or else it's not gonna get it out. So thank you. Excellent, thank you so much. We have time for one or two questions. Yeah. Hi, I'm Maria Bellino, the director of the HLA lab. And we are very involved in this because we want our patients to be transplanted and we see the donors go through and the whole thing. Um, I have been involved in other clinical trials at NIH and being kind of interpreter sometimes, because speaking that way is being so kind of an observer. One of the things that I've seen in oncology is drugs that are very brutal and treatments that are very good for that see people sometimes do volunteer, although they know they will die because it gives sense to their suffering. And usually those are people that are well educated, have a lot of social support, and are willing to do that, do that in a very conscious way. I see this situation more with this mm -hmm. at the beginning. So looking for the minorities and Unfortunately, many of the minorities in our country also doesn't have the social, don't have the social support, the education, the understanding. It's, they're wonderful human beings, but it would be the last person that I would put in that situation. And um, that's it's heavily burdened with me when we think about this. Well, you know, maybe that goes back to the idea that um, the first way to try to emphasize equity is through process. So, you know, you could basically say, um, you know, we have a kidney xenotransplant trial coming up. Let it be known. So at least the people who learned about it had an opportunity to come forward. Because um, I think what's happened so far, and this isn't a criticism, I think it's just the way it worked, was that the centers were identifying people and going to them. There could be sort of a two-way process where a patient had the opportunity to raise their hand and come forward. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but mm -hmm. um, you know that's a that's a two-way patient selection avenue. Ultimately, the patient's going to have to meet inclusion criteria. But if the the opportunity was known, then a patient could volunteer from any community. Mm -hmm. All right, we're just at the top of the hour, so I think we'll wrap there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.